when did they live, what happened to them, um, and really no more than that because in the next meetings we'll look, we'll, we'll look at the other issues like Ignatian prayer, discernment of spirits, discerning God's will, uh, there's one on women in the exercises but men are welcome to, to come to <laughs> because women played a big part in Ignatian's life, um, he was very fond of women. Um, <laughs> and the last one, um, the Jesuit to whom I go for spiritual direction, I've asked him to come and talk about the Jesuits today, you know, what's, what's happened really since, <coughs> since Ignatius' day. And that this, uh, this is our man, this is uh, Ignatius, one of the best known uh, photographs of him. If you go into Google and Right, Ignatius Loyola, and then press on the images, you'll get hundreds of pictures of them. Um, and basically, they all, they're a bit different, but basically, they all look the same. So, that's, that's roughly what Ignatius looked like. And he lived. <coughs> I don't know if many of you had any idea uh, when, when Ignatius lived. But he was born in 1491, and he died in 1556. I've got two, two maps here, and very briefly, this as you see is a map basically of, of Europe. Um, what we'll discover in the course of the evening is that Ignatius, he called, in his autobiography, which is not strictly speaking an autobiography, he calls himself the Pilgrim, constantly refers to him as the Pilgrim. And he walked thousands of miles uh, in the course of his life. And these are the key places. I'll just pick up a couple. There's Loyola, that's where he started. Then um, he finished up in, uh, in Rome, and a, a very important I don't want to find it on the road, a very important part of his life was in Paris as well, and he constantly kind of visits Barcelona, uh, going back and forward. But these are all the, the key places in his life. And if I could look at a slightly more limited uh, map, oh, sorry, this, this, this one. <coughs> that, that's. That's the Basque country, or some of it anyway, in, in northern Spain. And you can see there how near to France Loyola is. Um, and the key places again are Loyola, Pamplona, we'll see. Very shortly we'll see something about Arevalo. All these other places were important, but like Barcelona, Montserrat, which some of you will have seen, and uh, Mandresa. Um, but the other places all played a... Alcalá de Henares was, was a very important place. Uh, place as well. So it would be wonderful if you keep jumping back to those maps, but if you can try to have a, a, a general picture in your mind. That is a drawing, obviously, a painting of the house in which Ignatius was, was born. And you'll see from the house that there were a, they weren't a very high noble family, but they were in the lower levels of, of nobility. And that was the, that's their house. And the house actually still exists. Except that if you go to Loyola, you can't see it very well. That's it there. But it's surrounded. On this side here, they've got a huge uh, retreat centre. On this side here, there's a basilica. So the actual house itself, while it still exists, is only visible. I mean, you have to walk in through this wee uh, narrow passage <coughs> to, to get to the house. But it still exists. And you can see, if you look, the drawing is not... 100% accurate, there's a window short on the top, but you can see that it's very much the same, the same building today. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> I've appeared several times, most of these photographs were taken by me, but some of them come off again. That's me 20 years ago, standing outside the, the front door. If you, if you look again, you can see, you can see that it's the same door. Okay, so that's me. That, Quite simply, is the room uh, where Ignatius was born. You'll see that, but it says that about, it says <coughs> Inigo. Ignatius was a Latinized version of his name, which came much, came much later. But uh, Inigo was his, he managed Francis, yeah. Inigo was his own name. Now, a very important <coughs> part of trying to understand St. Ignatius is to appreciate the world into which he was born. And I've given you four dates there. In 1486, the Portuguese sailed round the tip of Africa. 1492, the Moors were expelled from Granada. And if you know anything about Spanish history, that's, that's a monumental moment. 
Also in 1492, Columbus sails the oceans blue. And in 1517, <coughs> Martin Luther is pinning his paper on the door at, uh, at Wittenberg. And of course, Ignatius is born in 1491. And the world he's born into hugely influences his life, as it does uh, with all of us. And one of the things, one of the things I like to do, actually, while I'm talking, you could maybe just take one of these. Uh, and it might help you to do a little bit of reflection as we're talking and also later. One of the, one of the things that is very, worth, very well worthwhile thinking about is how the world into which we were born has affected us. Some of us, I was born in 1945. I mean, that couldn't do anything else but influence us. It's the end of the Second World War, it's the beginning of the, the welfare state and getting orange at school and National Health Service and all that kind of thing. And we've lived through the 60s and so on. So the, the world into which we're born has a big influence on the way we live and how we see the world. And for Ignatius, the key thing here was that having expelled the Moors from Granada, and the Moors had landed in Spain in 711 in Gibraltar, and the, the mood of Spain at the time was one of adventure. It was full of people, especially from the poor parts of Spain, around Extremadura and so on, were flocking to the New World, filled with hopes of, um, of making fortunes. Some of them made a lot of money, some of them died of disease, some of them were killed in battles because in, during the early part of Ignatius' life, in fact all during his life, is <coughs> Spain is trying to hold together a huge empire. It's not an empire that they had conquered, they had kind of inherited it through weddings and marriages. And, and it was a, they had a very small population, it was a very poor country, and, and they were trying to hold all this together. <coughs> so people, some of Ignatius' brothers were killed in, in battle, some died of disease in the new world, and some actually did quite well for themselves. But it was a world where people were looking outwards, and that whole sense of adventure um, is very much part of the world that Ignatius grows up in. His, his full name, as you see, was Inigo. There should be an, an N U over that. I'm not sure how to, how to print you know, those kind of things. Inigo Lopez de Lanyasi Loyola was his full name. And his parents, as you see, were Beltran and Marina. And he was the youngest of seven sons and four daughters. That too was a big influence in it on his life. Very, very important too was the fact that his mother died when he was extremely young, so he wouldn't have remembered that. And in all his writings, he never mentioned his mother once, which is, which is indicative of something. That woman, Maria Garin, was an important uh, person in the she was, she was the blacksmith's wife. But she was his wet nurse and brought him up in the early part of his life. Martin was his oldest brother and Magdalena was, was the, his wife. And she plays an important <coughs> part in the relationship's psychic life anyway because um, as a young boy he kind of falls in love with her, he, he idolises her and he was full of that kind of stuff, you know. Um, that was, that was part of the spirit of the age. There was a, a, a daughter of Charles V, Catalina, whose mother was uh, uh, Juana Loca, John the, the Mad, if you know any of this part of Spanish history. And he, spot, he saw her once in, talk, in a place called Tordesillas, not far from Valladolid. And um, he idolized her and fantasized her. It was all about damsel in distress and knights in shining armor and all that kind of stuff. That, that, that was the world in which in which Ignatius grew up. And there's a man called Meissner, uh, an American Jesuit a psychiatrist, who wrote a book in 1991 to, to mark the centenary of Ignatius' birth. They did all kinds of things. And he kind of attempts to do something he says as himself isn't possible. He, he attempts to kind of psychoanalyze Ignatius from a distance. Well, you can't do that because the man's dead and you can't talk to him. But, but he tries to do it. And he sees all kinds of significance in the, in the lack of a mother and in the fact that idealizing women, the fact that women played such an important part of his life. One of his constant ministries was, was ministering to prostitutes, for example. So why all that was going on, you know, only psychiatrists would find out. But I just draw to your attention that people are aware of that. The first place Ignatius traveled to was Arevalo, 
Um, as you see, he spent quite a while there, from 1506 to 1517. And um, really, it was his first job. His father asked a friend of his, a man called Velasquez, who was the chief treasurer of the king, to take Ignatius under his wing and to and basically to uh, prepare him for life and, and give him a job. And he went there, and that's the castle. It's changed a lot. It's now local authority offices are in it. But that's where Ignatius went, and that's where he spent those those years of his life. When I went to Revel the first time, I was absolutely thrilled to find that square because there's a modern town round about it. But that square is more or less the way Ignatius would have known it. Um, because that church is much, much older than Ignatius. And I even, I was really thrilled to when I came across the Calle de San Ignacio de Loyola, the, the, the Ignatius Loyola Street. But in, in a revel, uh, Ignatius lived a life of luxury, really. It was a time of womanizing, drinking, gambling, and fighting. Um, Jewels and all that kind of stuff. It, it, it was a real, it, it was a pretty degenerate uh, time in his life, not the only one. And there is evidence that during that time he, he was involved in fairly serious uh, crime. He may even have killed somebody during that period. And if he didn't, you know, there were many opportunities when it could have happened when they were, they were fighting. Because it was, people often say that Ignatius was a soldier, but that's not true really. Because there were no such things as soldiers as we know. You know, there were, there were gentlemen who had swords and all the rest of it. And if there was a fight going, they would join somebody's army and, and, uh, and be part of it. But he wasn't a soldier in a sense. They didn't march up and down and all that kind of stuff, you know. People often exaggerate that and they see that Steve Ignatius is very authoritarian and military in his approach, but that isn't true. There's hardly a more flex, but you could hardly be more flexible in dealing with people that Ignatius was. But it, there was a military side to his life, of course, as there was to any gentleman's life at that time. At the end of those years in, in, in Arevalo, Velasquez fell out of favor at court, and, um, and so things fell apart. And Ignatius returned to Pamplona. And of course, those of you who know anything about Ignatius will know that Pamplona played a huge part in his life. For the first, there were several years there when uh, he continued his life of debauchery, relatively speaking. Compared to today, it might not have been all that debauchery. <laughs> <laughs> but for, for, for the time in which he lived, it was pretty, it was pretty debauched. And the person he came, the, the, person, the, the kind of gang he joined up there was that of the Viceroy of Navarre. Now Navarre, Navarra as we call it today, Navarre was an independent kingdom. Spain was full of independent kingdoms. That, they're still struggling with that today, you know, with all the regionalism and separatism and so on. But the king of Spain had taken over uh, Navarre, and the French had come with a view to, um, to taking it back. Um, the French thought they were liberating Navarre, and the Spaniards also thought they were liberating Navarre. Uh, Navarre. But the French were far more, they had a huge army, and there wasn't much of a fight, except that, that's me again, with St. Ignatius and Pamplona. Um, the, the, the garrison in Pamplona was, um, surrendered here, really. but there were some of them who were in a kind of a tower, and Ignatius persuaded them not to surrender. I mean, it was, it was madness. I mean, there was a whole army outside, and there was a handful of them. But Ignatius, this gives you an indication into his kind of character. He persuaded them not to surrender and to charge out, you know, do a die kind of stuff. And they were doomed. Except that when they charged out, Ignatius was hit by the famous cannonball and his uh, legs were shattered and everybody else laid down. Their... So that was the end of it, you know, because the whole thing was his idea <laughs> in the first place. And that's, that uh, statue there, there's a copy of it outside the house in Loyola. That's him uh, being carried uh, back to Loyola. That, that would, you might notice that I'm a bit older than that one, and it wasn't the previous one, because that was just a couple of years ago. That's an actual photograph of the event. <laughs> <laughs> which I got on the internet. 
So he's carried back over the mountains to Loyola. Uh, and this is 1521-22. And this, of course, is, is possibly the key moment, one of, certainly one of the key moments of his whole life. This is, this is when he has his conversion experience that some of you will, will know about. When he arrived back, um, and it was, you can imagine how painful it was being carried over a mountain back to Loyola, because it's a very mountainous part of Spain now. The doctors realized that his legs hadn't healed properly. There was a bit of bone sticking out of his leg. And he was so vain, really, that he insisted that the bones be rebroken and, and, and reset, because he didn't want to be less attractive to women. <laughs> and the bone sticking out of his leg. <laughs> and, and a limb. So all, this, this, this was done. And for, there was a period during which he almost uh, died. And that was important to him, to be close to death, as close to death as that made him think. And that was the beginning of his conversion, really. On the 24th of June that year, which is the feast of, uh, of John the Baptist, of the, of the birth of John the Baptist, I think it is, um, the doctor famously told him, and Ignatius tells us this in his letter by everybody, he was told that um, if he was no better by midnight, he was a dead man. But when midnight came, he improved. And that's the room in which um, this all happened. That painting there, uh, uh, there are a series of these. I've put them on the, the PowerPoint because these are the, these are the paintings that are on the wall. They were painted by a fairly well known Spanish artist of the 20th century. He did a lot of propaganda stuff for the nationals during the Civil War, but that doesn't take away from his quality as an artist. And people have sometimes thought that these are the stations of the cross, but they're not. <laughs> they are moments, or a start, there's only ten of them, but they're, they're moments in the life of St. Ignatius. So maybe, maybe the next time you're in, especially if you're local, um, you could actually have a wee look at them, because that's what they are. And that is a depiction of Ignatius um, convalescing in Loyola. And that is the oratory in the house in Loyola, and that, that little a painting which the light is reflected on, um, that Ignatius knew that. I mean, that, that, was, that was part of the, the house. <coughs> there. But of course, he had this famous experience. He, had, he was lying there for months, and some of you will know this story very well. But he was lying there for months, and he had to pass the time. And there weren't very many uh, books in the house, but there were some of the romantic novels that he liked, and, and he read them, but he eventually ran out of them. Even if he had read them several times, he would run out of them. And he was reduced to reading two other books that were in the house. One was A Life of the Saints, and the other was uh, A Life of Christ. Not the New Testament itself, but A Life of Christ. And I'm going to read to you his own account of this. Um, but I say to you earlier that although they call this his autobiography, he didn't, strictly speaking, write it. Towards the end of his life, when he was in Rome, the Jesuits were trying to get him to tell his story. And so um, what, he used, what they got him to do was after supper, he would, there was a flat roof, and after supper, he would walk around with his, uh, with his secretary, Luis Cantal, the camera, and um, he would tell camera the story and then Ignatius, and then Cameron wrote it down. But this is what um, he, he says himself. He was reading these books, you see, and he had this fundamental experience that he noticed that the books had there were two different reactions in himself to them. Now, I'm doing the exercises at the moment with a, with a girl, who's a, a woman who's a psychiatrist, um, I thought at one point she might be here to make some, some of these comments, but she, she says it's the best thing she's ever done in her life doing the exercises. But um, she agrees with me that Ignatius was a psychological genius. Long before psychology was invented, Ignatius did something that nobody did in the 16th century. He took his own experience seriously. He paid attention to what was going on inside himself, and he trusted it and he acted on it. So what he noticed was, um, he says, in reading the life of our Lord and 
In reading the life of our Lord and the life of the saints, he paused to think and reason with himself. Supposing that I should do what St. Francis did and St. Dominic did. That was one of his great mistakes at the beginning. He wanted to imitate St. Francis and St. Dominic, and it took him a long time to realize that you can't imitate somebody else. You, know, you have to live your own life. But he must let his thought run over many things that seemed good to him, always putting before himself things that were difficult and important which seemed to him easy to accomplish when he proposed them. But all his thought was to tell himself, St. Dominic did this, therefore I must do it. St. Francis did, therefore I must do it. These thoughts also lasted a good while. And then other things taking their place, the worldly thoughts above mentioned came upon him and remained a long time with them. This succession of diverse thoughts was of long duration. And they were either of worldly achievements which he desired to accomplish, or those of God which took hold of his imagination to such an extent that, worn out with the struggle, he turned them all aside and gave his attention to other things. There was, however, this difference. When he was thinking of the things of the world, he was filled with delight. But when afterwards he dismissed them from weariness, he was dry and dissatisfied. And when he thought of going barefoot to Jerusalem, and of eating nothing but herbs and performing the other, other rigors he saw that the saints had performed, he was consoled, not only when he entertained these thoughts, but even after dismissing them, he remained cheerful and satisfied. Now that might seem, what does that mean? But it was the beginning of Ignatius' understanding of discernment. The romantic novels delighted him, but it didn't last. The reading of the lives of the saints and the reading of Jesus delighted him, but it lasted. And he noticed that. And he took it seriously. And it developed into his whole understanding of spiritual consolation and spiritual desolation. It takes, of course, a long time for that to develop, as we'll see. But that, that was the beginning of that experience. And it took place there in the house in Loyola. <coughs> At the end of that period, he decided to head you know, for months of that. But something happened in the way, which is why I've got that picture of a, a mule. Again, it's a famous event in Ignatius' life. But when he left Loyola, and by the way, I also wanted to read another paragraph here. Um, <coughs> yeah, just a few sentences. But it, it kind of goes back to the whole question of Ignatius as well. At the moment when he leaves Loyola, having recovered and head for months, back, this is what the author says. Inigo was 30 years old. The year was 1521. In Rome, Peter's Basilica was being built. And of course, behind that was all the scandal about indulgences in Luther and the, and the Reformation. The Pope had excommunicated Martin Luther. John Calvin was 11 years old, and Teresa of Avila, 6. The Church was about to elect Pope Adrian VI, a reformer. The European nations were vying for power in, the power in and possession of the New World. And into, the, into this milieu, the pilgrim Inigo set out on his journey. I think that's very powerful, you know, to, to live at such a crossroads in, in, in European history as that, in world history really, and to set out into it. Um, I just think it's an amazing moment. But anyway, the mule, he sets off, <coughs> not, he's not far gone from Loyola, when he meets a Moor, an Arab, and he gets into conversation with him. Now, when I tell you what the conversation was about, you might think I had nothing better to talk about. There were no football. We didn't. <laughs> but people talked about different things in the 16th century from the from the do today, and the discussion was about the virgin birth. That's an interesting talk. And the Moor was quite happy with the notion that Mary was a virgin before um, Jesus was born. But what he couldn't accept was that she was a virgin before, during, and after, which is what they believed at that time. So they kind of talked about this, and then the moor turned off the road 
he went into a village. And Ignatius started to think about this. And he started to get mad. Because a lot of conversion has happened. You know, the same basic person is still there. And he feels like going after this moor and stabbing him. That's what he feels like. But his discernment is so poor at this point. This is the evidence that, of how long it takes. He can't make up his mind. He doesn't know how to resolve this, this uh, dilemma. And so what does he do? He decides that the mule, the mule will make up his mind. So if the mule goes into the village, he'll go after the mule, and if the mule goes straight on, he'll go where the mule, the mule goes. And the significance of that is, as I say, that as yet, his understanding of what becomes a sin <coughs> is, is very limited. So off he goes to Montserrat. Some of you will have been there in Montserrat. I think you'll recognize that mountain range. That's why it's called Montserrat, of course, because it's like, it's like a saw. And there's the monastery, of course. And there since the 9th century. And that's the church. And that's the, the Black Madonna of Montserrat. It's very, very important still to the people of, uh, of Catalonia. And in Montserrat, Ignatius, <coughs> would you believe it, goes to confession and spends three hours at confession. <laughs> um, and then he spends a, a night in vigil before the Madonna, as knights did in those days. There's a moment in Don Quixote where the same thing uh, happens. So a, and in the morning, he lays down his sword, which is in a convent in Barcelona still, and he gives his clothes to a beggar. He swaps clothes with the beggar. And this is a significant symbolic uh, moment in his life. And then he heads for... Oh, sorry, that's me standing at the end. See, it says, uh, Sanctus Ignatius. Underneath. That, that's in once of that. He heads for Manresa. This is a very important part of his life as well. In Manresa, he's, he's got these beggar's clothes and he starts something really which goes on for the rest of his life, which is begging. He begged a lot um, for, to exist. Um, he, was, he just lived such a poor life in Manresa. He was known as the holy man in Manresa. And at this point, a person comes into his life called, called Ines Pasquale. She looked after him. He probably wouldn't have survived if it hadn't been for this woman. And women like that keep appearing in Ignatius' life who kind of care for him and, um, and look after him. He practiced a lot of penance, he damaged his health, he suffered for the rest of his life what doctors reckoned was gallstones, and it was because of the way he abused his body in Manresa. He suffered from depression, had doubts and scruples, and seriously considered suicide at one point. Um, he was troubled by the thought, and this was to do with sexuality and celibacy and so on as well. He, he thought, how can I live like this for the rest of my life? That was, that's, what, that's what pulled him down. And, it, and he had that moment of insight where it suddenly dawned on him and he couldn't guarantee himself another hour of life. So why was he worrying about the rest of his life? You know, it might never happen. Um, that, that, was a, that was a turning point for him as well. But he learned from all that stuff. Um, and one of the things that happened when he came to write the constitution of the Jesuits and so on, he, he advised people very much against those extremes. But he didn't have that kind of help and advice himself, you know, so he did, he did damage to, to his body. He lived in that, that cave, and again, that's me down there on the left-hand side. Um, that was, was obviously putting it full of altars and candles and stuff at that time. Um, and that is the bridge over the the River Carbonaire, which, which runs through Manresa. And here we come to another um, <coughs> crucial point in Ignatius' life. Because he was walking one day, if I can find this, part, this section. Yeah. He was walking by the river one day. He was going to a church which was about a mile from Manresa. And the road, he says, ran close to, to the river. <coughs> and he, was, he stopped and he was looking into the river. And then this is what, this is what he says. He always talks in the third person because he's telling the story to the camera. He says, as he sat, the eyes of his understanding began to open. 
He beheld no vision, but he saw and understood many things, spiritual as well as those concerning faith and learning. This took place with so great an illumination that these things appeared to be something altogether new. He cannot point out the particulars of what he then understood, although they were many, except that he received a great illumination <coughs> in his understanding. This was so great that in the whole course of his life, right up to his 62nd year, if he were to gather all the helps he had received from God and everything he knew and add them together, he does not think that they would equal all that he received at that one time. And again, on that sheet that I've given you, that's it's one of the questions, you know, has, has anything like that ever happened to you? Because I believe it will have happened to many of you, possibly to all of you. It was a moment of insight, it was a moment of intuition. And Ignatius would take intuition very seriously because it bypasses all the logical, rational way in which we know things. It takes it, takes it instantly. Into, into a much deeper place. And they reckon, they reckon that what he saw so clearly really at that time was, was what became um, his rules for the sermon of spirits. And again, I want to read something which, um, out of this book here, which is a simplification of a, of a much bigger book in Spanish. It says, scientists of the soul refer to this transition with a rational, reflective consciousness to the field of profound intuition as an altered state of consciousness. Very modern phrase. <clears throat> People take drugs to try and get altered states of consciousness. Such unexpected and indescribable experiences the pilgrim underwent are special gifts given to privileged persons of very different religious backgrounds and in every era of history. They are not permanent states but passing stages. Their effects, however, are stable and long-lasting. Peace and harmony take possession of such mm -hmm. persons. When one has learned through discursive knowledge, what one has learned through discursive knowledge seems obscure and incomplete compared to what comes through intuition. This illumination affects the deepest layers of one's being. The recipient becomes aware of the newness of things. From the depth of his interior, he communicates with the universe and with someone who remains outside it, but who yet remains present to him in all of his difficulties. Everything seemed altogether new to him, and he had the impression of being a different man. He began to see with other eyes than those he had. A different man, other eyes, altogether new things. These are charismatic phrases. And again, if you have time, I would invite you to reflect, because I think I had one moment like that in my life, and only lasted a fraction of a second. But it shaped my whole life, as this experience did, Ignatius' And you will have had such experiences as well. Um, and then it was gone. So Thomas Aquinas, of course, famously said, well, he learned, and he was, you know, one of the great minds of, of Western civilization. He says that, what he saw in one, compared to what he saw in one moment of contemplation, everything he had ever learned was like straw. And so there are deeper ways of knowing things than the intellect. But you have to trust them. Because one of the surest signs, as I've said to some of you many times, one of the surest signs of God at work is when you have an experience like that and then you doubt it. Then you think, did I make that up? And you rationalize it. <coughs> and you take the power out of it. And the reason that happens, I'm convinced, is that we have a God who never forces himself on us. And so when we have those kind of experiences, there's a gap, and you have to choose to bridge that gap. You have to choose to believe it. Ultimately, you have to choose to trust your own experience. And that's what Ignatius encourages people to do all the time, to trust their own experience. And we find that so difficult to do because it's very risky. It's much simpler to keep rules and obey regulations and do what everybody else is doing. Because if you have to if you have to respond to that kind of movement in yourself, you might be wrong. What if you're wrong? 
but it's, it's a vital part of Ignatius' understanding of spirituality. That is, that's, um, that's my Mesa now. The bit above the bridge there is the big Ignatian uh, retreat centre, and the, the cave is underneath it. And of course, that's another of these uh, paintings, and that's Ignatius in my Mesa writing the spiritual exercises. After Manresa, he goes to Barcelona, and he's gone to Barcelona as a step towards um, the one thing he wants to do is, is uh, get a boat there to go to Jerusalem. Now, at this particular point in the story, I couldn't find a photograph that was that belonged to that period, and so I decided to show you a picture of three people who caused endless spiritual desolation to me all the time. <laughs> 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 for those of you who don't know who to call well, that yes, that Messi and Javi who, who play for Barcelona so I thought I'd throw them in because I, I didn't have anybody else <clears throat> Ignatius goes from Barcelona over to Rome I, I, tried to keep, I need to try and stop, cut some of this story out because it's, there's so much to it but when he arrives in Italy, the place is ravaged with a plague. Uh, so they have a hard, hard time. Towns have a, doors closed and won't let anybody in because of the plague and so on. And Rome is ravaged by the plague. But Ignatius goes to Rome, spends a very short time there, holy week there, ministers to the sick and all that. All his life now he's ministering to the sick and helping the poor. And from Rome, he goes to Venice and sails to Jerusalem. Now that's not the boat he <laughs> <laughs> sailed in, but I thought it's a picture of a boat sailing out of Venice, so uh, I thought that was as good as any. So he gets, the, he gets a boat uh, to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was where he had wanted to go from, from the left to uh, Loyola, and he's there for about 20 days only in 1523. And the reason he's there for such a short time is that the Franciscans who looked after the holy places and still do today <coughs> wouldn't let him stay. In fact, they wouldn't let anybody stay because because uh, Jerusalem was a very dangerous <coughs> place to be at this time. Um, there were constant threats of wars between, the, not unlike today, between the Ottoman Empire and and, um, and the West and so on. This is heading within 20, 30 years to the Battle of Lepanto, you know. With, uh, but Europe is saved from, if, if, if Europe hadn't won the battle of Lepanto, if the Christians hadn't won it, we would probably be Muslims today. But, uh, so all of this is going on at the time, so he's not allowed to stay. He tries very hard to convince them that he should stay, because he wants, as part of them wants to be martyred. Um, which is very interesting too, because we tend, we tend to think that Muslims today who want to be martyred are off their heads, but Christians have that tradition as well. So trees of Avila when she was a child. Toddler though, ran away. How far she got, I don't know, maybe just down the street. But she ran away because she wanted to be martyred by the Moors. And Ignatius had this in him as well. And it was it was running through the culture of, of the time. But um, the only thing that got him to leave was the threat of excommunication. And and he left. <coughs> that of course is where he's home. And that's the church of the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives was very, very important to Ignatius at that time. I won't get into the details of it. And then he goes back basically to Barcelona. When he's not allowed to stay in Jerusalem, he's, he's, he's left with the question, what am I going to do? Because that was his aim when he left Loyola, was to go to Jerusalem. And what he really wants to do, and this keeps popping up all the time, it's the crazy movie itself. He wants to help people. But fundamentally what he wants to do, and this becomes clear to him, he wants to help people to discover the will of God in their life. He wants everybody to be the unique individuals that they're called to be. He basically wants them all to do what he's doing and trust his own experience. But at this particular time, it's very, very difficult for him to do this because he's uneducated and he's a layman. And so he, he decides that the answer is to start to study. And he goes back to Barcelona. At this stage, he's going to catechism classes. He's sitting listening to sermons and churches and so on. Um, and then he starts to learn grammar and the basics, the basics of education. And this is the, 
This is a church just off the Rambles in Barcelona, which some of you may have been called Santa Maria del Mar. And in this church, there's a step. It says, seated in this church, Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Society of Jesus, begged uh, during, during uh, those years. And I don't know whether it's the actual step or not, but that's what it says. And there's me sitting beside it. Right? That's me again 20 or years ago. Um, so he's begging to survive. He's trying to learn the basics of the faith. He's trying to learn um, grammar and the things he would need to, to, for the next stage of his life. And eventually, those who are teaching him tell him that he's ready for the next stage and he heads off to Alcalá de Henares. Al the University of Alcalá de Henares and the University of Salamanca were the Oxford and Cambridge of Spain at the time. And there still is an Al a university in Alcalá de Henares, but it's not the same one. Um, at some point it moved to Madrid and more recently they, they established a new one. Um, but this was an important <coughs> university and Ignatius went there in 1526. And again he begged in the streets. The children this time mocked him and laughed at him and threw stones at him and all that kind of thing. You can imagine what's going on. And that's almost very likely the, the very street in which uh, this happened. Um, because that's obviously the old street. And on that street was a, an old hospital. When, as you probably realise, when they talked about hospitals in those days, it's not what we think of as a hospital. There were kind of hostels, there were refugees, there were beggars went and, and so on. And the, 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 the man who was running that saw him being mocked and so on in the street and invited him to come in. And that, that says there that in this place, you know, Ignatius and all of that, we quote from the exercises. That's the inside of the, the building, which is still an old folks' home, actually. And there is the room in which Ignatius uh, lived. And he was about a year and a half in, in the Alcalá de Henares. He gave the, he was starting giving the exercises. Again, it was women mostly he was giving the exercises to. He had his first real brush with the Inquisition. He was in jail for about 18 days because they were very suspicious of him. What was he teaching? You know, was he a heretic and all this kind of thing? Uh, but eventually he was released from prison. But, he could, but the interesting thing is that while he was in prison, people still came to him. And there was one particular person whose name, Maria de... I've lost... Uh, let's go to the yeah. um, I think that was her name. She was a prostitute. And she had asked him to, to help her. And she continued to come while, while he was in the jail. He had told her... Would have, she would have to spend 30 days with her. And this was the exercises. And the interesting thing is that the Inquisition um, in, interviewed her. And the fantastic thing about the Inquisition is that they were phenomenal record keepers. It was the Inquisition that really taught Europe how to keep records. All the civil service stuff that we keep now. The Inquisition kept a detailed record of everything that happened, everything they did, everything. There was no hiding, no 25 year rules and all that kind of stuff. They kept fantastic records, and we do have a record of the interview with her, and she explains to them what she's doing with Ignatius, and it's so clear that it's the exercises more or less as we know them today. That's a little chapel in the place where he lived. That's a picture of him ministering, and that tells you about his stay in, uh, in Alcalá de Henares, and that's his name on the wall of Alcalá University. However, he's eventually released by the, by the Inquisition and he heads for <coughs> Salamanca. He wasn't all that long in Salamanca. I know some of you know Salamanca. That's the university <coughs> there which he attended. That's the church of San Estema. And again, that's run by the Dominicans. And again, he found himself in jail you know, for three weeks, no, six weeks it was, by the Inquisition because all the time, because he's a layman, because he's not formally educated, the Inquisition is terrified that he's preaching heresy. They're, ex they're examining him all the time. What is he telling people? They're, they're all they're up to read the exercises and see what it's all about. And, because that was the spirit of the time. And so it becomes clearer and clearer to... That's, that's the, one of the rooms of the university. Some of you will remember that. Where he would have sat listening. But what he decides to do 
He said, I need to do something about this education. And so he decides to go to Paris. One of the advantages of going to Paris is that it gets away from the Spanish Inquisition. And he, at this point, had started to gather a few followers together, and some in Alcala and some in, um, in Salamanca, but they, they, never, they never stayed with him. So he went to Paris. That's the Sorbonne. It's a, it says at the bottom it's, a, it's an, an engraving from the 17th century, so that 100 years after Ignatius was there, but it would be kind of something like that. That's the shirt that he wore during his time <laughs> in, in, in the University of Paris. It was the same one, he never ever changed it. <laughs> that, of course, is the Sacre Coeur, and um, that's, that's in the, the top of Montmartre, and, and that was very, very uh, important. Again, it's an important part of his life. I'm ignoring these, uh, these pages, but I'll move forward and try and catch up with myself. Um, yeah, again in Paris. By the way, to get to Paris from Salamanca, he doesn't take the diary route, he goes to Barcelona and then walks up to Paris. I mean, it's astonishing the distances that these people in those, in those days traveled, walking. Um, but at this point, uh, he's 37 years old, so, so he's, a, he's a mature student. He did something very foolish at this point. So people always gave him money. They always do the priest all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, although he wasn't a priest at this point. And he did a very foolish thing. He got three followers. Again, he, was always, he always had this idea of gathering a group around him, <coughs> which of course eventually happened. And there were three Spaniards, and they made the mistake of giving all the money he had to one of them to keep for him. Now that, I don't know what exactly that says, but he must have had a reason for not trusting himself. Because he gave it to this fellow to, to keep for him, and he spent it all. <laughs> um, again, it was Ignatius, he, he spent it all and, and headed away from Paris towards Spain, but he fell ill at Rouen and, and wrote to Ignatius. And you can see that the transformation that's taking place in Ignatius, because he's mad at him, but he tends to, he decides not to be mad, and he goes, he follows him, helps him. And gives him letters for, uh, for friends that he, he has in Spain and basically um, chooses. He chooses to act not, not out of the anger or the desolation but out of the, the teaching of the gospel. And this is what he's getting better and better at, deciding what to do with all the, the feelings that are going on inside um, So he's back to having to beg. And during these years in Paris, he, he begs abroad. Um, he went to Bruges and he went to Antwerp and he went one summer uh, to London. That's what they did during the summer, they went to beg. Begging, of course, in those days was not quite what it is now. There was no social security system, there was nothing like that. And so begging was the standard way in which people survived in, a lot, in lots of cases. And giving to beggars was one of the ways in which people with no money redistributed wealth. You know, so there was a kind of understanding that begging was not exactly a reputable thing to do, but it was, it was acceptable. And that's how he financed himself, begging. But he was always, all the time, giving the spiritual exercises. And Paris was a much smaller place than, than it was than it is now. And so he became well known, he became the kind of talk of Paris, and was accused of being a seducer of students. Because students were starting to follow him, and they were starting to work with the poor as well. Um, and there were lots of rumours going round about him, and, and so on. But he gathered to, around him in Paris a group which became the basis of the Jesuits. These were the first companions. And in that church there, Saint Denis in, in Montmartre, Montmartre is the kind of bohemian part of <coughs> Paris, where all the artists and all the rest of them are. Um, there, he um, they committed themselves to, to uh, on the 15th of August, 1534, to a total giving to God. And again, there was this idea, we'll go to the Holy Land. You know, it never kind of quite disappeared. And one of the questions I've put this sheet is, is there an equivalent of that in your life? Is there something that you, takes you years to discover isn't for you? You know, just keep pursuing something that um, acts as a bit of a fantasy. But, and that's what the Holy Land was for the Anyway, um, 
So they, they, they agree to form some kind of community. And that, again, that's one of the, that's one of the pictures. And, uh, no, that's, 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 <coughs> that's it there. The ones that, there. There was only one of the companions at that time who was a priest. That was Peter Faber, or Pierre Favre. You may have noticed some of you that Pope Francis canonized him in June and December because he's always been, he's always been a great admirer of him. Um, but that one there is, um, is Ignatius and Francis' saviour. And the reason I've got that house, which I hope you wouldn't have seen at this point, the difference between the kind of people that Ignatius is meeting now <laughs> is that he's meeting the elite in Paris. These, these, are, <coughs> these are from well-off families and good backgrounds and so on. And an outstanding example of that was, was Francis Sager. And to illustrate that, I thought I'd show a picture of his, of his home <laughs> in, in Javier in, in Spain, near Pamplona. That's how it was then. And so that was the kind of, these were the kind of people that he was meeting at this point. And that's them they're committing themselves to this service of God. And those are the names. Those are the, so those are the first Jesuits. Some of them you may, you'll have heard of Francis Xavier, certainly. Um, have you heard of any of the others? Well, Pierre, oh, sorry, that should, that should be an E at the end of Pierre, not Pierre, obviously. Um, but those, those are the first companions. That's them again, another, another photograph of them. Uh, that happened in 1534. And in 1535, Ignatius goes back to Spain you know, for the first time um, and agrees that next year they will meet together in Venice. And he goes back home. Um, strangely, he, he doesn't stay in the family home. He stays in one of these hospitals because it's part of his poverty. Um, and he causes a wee bit of a stir because he tries to sort out some of the things that are going on in the local area which he doesn't approve of. I thought an amusing one was that um, apparently girls at that age, they didn't wear anything on their hair until they were married. Once you had a hat on, that meant they were married. And there were lots of girls around the place who were wearing hats, but who weren't married, but who were concubines of the local priest or <laughs> some say I'm the street and Ignatius didn't like this at all, you know, and he, um, he spoke to the local authorities and, and had something done about it. It's interesting too that his brother Martin was very unhappy about Ignatius walking all the time. Um, <coughs> And he persuaded them to, um, while he was in, in Loyola, to use a horse, you know, because they were a, they were, they were a fairly noble family. And so uh, he was embarrassed by the fact that his brother was walking about instead of on a horse. Um, that's, that's the valley. All of that down there, of course, is the huge complex that's there now. But the house, was, as you saw at the beginning, is in the middle of that. That's the basilica of Loyola as it is today. But anyway, he left. He left Loyola, left Spain for the last time, went to Barcelona, went to Venice, and in 1536, the others eventually all arrived uh, from Paris. Again, they still wanted to go to the Holy Land, but it didn't materialize, so they went to Rome. They arrived in 1537. A wee picture of Venice just to keep it going. And then they went to Rome in 1537. And we're coming now, there's lots of things happening in Rome, but we're coming to with regard to, here, to the end of the, of the story. In Rome, they continued to work with the poor, prostitutes, and then teaching children. Um, eventually, they're, they're approved. At, of course, that's St. Peter's, which was being built at the time. Um, that, that's a moment, just as Ignatius approaches Rome, when he first sees sight of Rome, um, at a little place called La Storta, he has a another of those very spiritual experiences. That's it being depicted and again it's on the wall. <coughs> That's me standing out the doors, outside the door of that church, outside Rome. If any of you have ever been in Scots College in Rome, which I haven't, but I've passed by it, a storter has just popped out the same road about 10 minutes from the In 1541, he was elected um, general of the, of the Jesuits. And he spent the rest of his life in what he would have seen as being a prisoner in Rome. You see, 
he had he had wanted to do great things. He had wanted to be a missionary. He had wanted to go out and convert the rulers of the martyr. Um, and in the end, he spent those last 16 years of his life running the Jesuits from Rome. And it was other people that did all the things he wanted to do. Francis Xavier went to India and, um, and China. Uh, people that you know, remember the film The Mission. These were the early Jesuits. So all of that was being done. And here he was just administering it all, writing the constitutions. He wrote, he wrote in, in excess of 6,000 letters. To, he kept in touch with them by, by letters. Um, but he himself um, never fulfilled all those things that he dreamt of and fantasized about as a child. And again, that's something that I think is on that sheet. We all have to come to terms with. We have to come to terms with our lives as they are, as opposed to what we what once fancied that they would be. <coughs> and Ignatius has to do that um, during this time. That's me standing outside these rooms, which you can still visit next to the Jesus, which is the well, it's one of the spirit. That's me and Ignatius because that's a copy of his death mask, and that's his actual height. You know, he was a he was a wee man. <laughs> that's important because that's the desk on which he wrote all his letters. You know that. Um, it's not exactly a modern office, and that's his that's his uh, his uh, what do you call it signature. And that's very important too, because that's a pair of his shoes. And, and considering the, the distance he walked in his life, you know, it's, um, I'm sure he didn't walk in all of that pair of shoes, but um, he must have had at least two. But, but that is, that's his shoes. Again, that's, again, from the pictures around the wall, that's Pope Adrian, or that was Paul III, I think, approving the Constitution <coughs> and the Jesuits become, become what they are today, a religious order. That's, an, again, one of the pictures from around the wall. They were so filled with enthusiasm at this time, you know, you know that they, they were just so filled with delight about all the ministry they were doing. That's a, that's a depicted. That's Ignatius. At this particular time, the stories of him just being reduced to tears during mass. He was so moved by everything at this point in his life, and he died in 1556 on the 31st of July, which is when his feast day is. That's again a depiction of his death. That's me sitting in the room where he died. That's his tomb. He's in that casket there. Um, in 1609 he was gratified. He was canonized on the 12th of March 1622, along with three other great Spanish saints, St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, and one who's slightly less known, St. Isidore of Seville. And that was... And that leaves only the question of his legacy. To some extent, the first thing I wanted to show you about his legacy was Vatican II, because you may remember, but those of you who attended the course last year, the talk I gave was about the universal call to holiness. But every baptized person is called to sanctity. It was Ignatius that developed that notion. So the Second Vatican Council was a real vindication of everything that Ignatius stood for. Again, his legacy. These are the things that he's left us. The Society of Jesus, the exercises, the whole, the whole notion of retreats came out of Ignatius. Discernment, education, the enormous influence of the Jesuits on education, and the missions and so on. I've, I've read, I've never read this anywhere else, but I'm assured that things that we take for granted today in, in education <coughs> were, were introduced by the Jesuits. The, the idea, for example, that you would work your way through a curriculum, we take that for granted. But people didn't used to do that. You just turned up at lectures and classes. It was all kind of mixed up. And it was the Jesuits that developed the notion of a curriculum which develops from, from one year to the, to the next. And of course, the, they have schools and universities all over the world. And of course, there's a huge missionary the aspect to the Society of Jesus as well. Um, and that basically is the kind of stuff I'm hoping that uh, we'll look at over the, over the coming months. So that's really all I wanted to say about it. Um, there's loads of other stuff that I have looked down there. There's, there's loads of other things that I could say. But I hope at least you have some idea of who this man is and that it has at least 
Where did you that they perhaps they find out more about all these other issues as the months go on? Okay. Thank you very much.